Whether you're a fan of UNC Chapel Hill or not, this story affects you. It's about a green gift made to the people of North Carolina a long time ago. When you think of Chapel Hill, what landmarks come to mind? The Bell Tower, the Old Well, or Wilson Library? What names do you think of? Michael Jordan and Dean Smith? Football great Charlie Choo Choo Justice? Andy Griffith? Charles Kuralt? And John Motley Moorhead of the Moorhead Planetarium? There are two other names with which you may not be familiar, the Morgans and Masons. Without these names, Chapel Hill and higher education in North Carolina as we know it could have been very different. I went to Charlotte Jones Rowe, an extraordinary naturalist at the North Carolina Botanical Garden, to learn about two families whose names you should know. Mark Morgan and his Barbie cousins came to North Carolina to look for land. They looked in several drainages nearby and settled on this rich land here in what is known as the outfall of Morgan's Creek. And they decided this would be a great place to locate their family and have a successful farm. Fortunately for North Carolina, Mark Morgan, in addition to being an excellent farmer, wore other hats in his community. The Morgans and the Barbies were leaders in the community. And Mark Morgan was a vestryman in the Church of England. And the nearest church was at Hillsboro. That was a long ride to get to church on Sunday. And so uh, one of the first projects was to establish a chapel of ease, as it was called, for ease of access on what is now Chapel Hill. Mark Morgan owned most of the top of what is now Chapel Hill and during his later lifetime he sold off and traded off parcels of land to ten other farmers. These tracks met at the top of the hill. Mark Morgan was a well-educated man himself and a great believer in education and he was probably one of the leaders who encouraged William Davy and other uh, state leaders and founding fathers of our state to meet at Chapel Hill on that legendary day when they met under what is now the Davy Poplar, and he was surely there, and he encouraged them to consider this tract and um, then helped to convince the farmers that it was in everyone's interest in the state to put this piece of land back together. And so Mark Morgan and his uh, who died before the process was complete, and his son by the same name were very instrumental in assembling the land that was offered to the state as this community's gift to ensure that our state would have the first state university. Remember I told you there are two names to remember, Morgan and Mason. The land we know as Mason Farm received that name because Mark Morgan's great-granddaughter, Mary Elizabeth Morgan, married James Pleasant Mason. Reverend Mason was from Alamance County. He went to Wake Forest for his education, and he was a well-respected Baptist minister in this area. He was also an extremely hardworking farmer. And we know about his activities from some half century of journal keeping where he recorded daily about the weather and his activities on the farm. And in reading the journals, it occurred to me that Reverend Mason did as much work before breakfast as most people did all day long. He expanded the, the family lands and put more land in cultivation and cared for it, stewarded it six days a week. On the seventh day, when others were resting, he tended to his church congregations. The Masons and Morgans, like most other large farmers of the time, did not work their land holdings without help. The Masons did not farm this large tract of land alone. Like others who were in the farm economy of North Carolina in the early 1800s and middle 1800s, 
the Masons owned slaves. And at one time, there were uh, 100 slaves, a number of families here on the property. And there are Masons still in our community who are descended from slaves who worked this land. It must be noted that many of the most important lands in North Carolina and the Southeast, Mason Farm included, are the legacy of both the landholders and the many African American families who toiled in the fields and forest. Reverend and Mrs. Mason had four children. Two of the children died in early childhood and they are buried in the cemetery near the old home site, which is near the Finley Golf Course Clubhouse at this time. They later had two other daughters, Maddie and Rena, as they were called. The Mason's daughters loved to hike the hills and they loved the old forest along the north facing slopes that weren't cleared for plowing and cultivation. And uh, we know from notes that they loved to collect wildflowers have them identified, and they were, they were children of the land as well as young ladies of a cultivated era. The tragedy in the Mason's life continued as both Maddie and Rena died of typhoid fever, a waterborne illness, leaving no heirs to inherit the farm from Reverend Mason and his wife. Even through this family tragedy, the Masons still found a way to demonstrate their love of the land. The Masons made a statement as well as a great gift when they left 800 acres to the University of North Carolina and only made a few simple requests for the family and its legacy. And that was that the family cemetery be maintained. To that end, they left $1,000, a tremendous sum in the 1890s. They asked that portraits be made of their daughters and that those portraits be hung in an appropriate place in the university. The point that has probably had the most effect on the land was the third condition, and that was that the land was not to be divided and sold off. That land has always been a part of the university, and there are several areas that most people would know that are on that land. One of these is the Friday Center, Another is the Finley Golf Course, and the land we are on today, the Mason Farm Biological Reserve, and the North Carolina Botanical Garden. A significant portion of the Botanical Garden is on the Mason land. This gift comprises the largest part of the North Carolina Botanical Garden, directed by my good friend, Dr. Peter White. The Botanical Garden is over 700 acres of university land, and that land includes some diverse places. I think lots of folks know about the Coker Arboretum, that beautiful display garden on the heart, at the heart of campus. And some folks know about the Mason Farm Biological Reserve, which is a tremendous uh, diverse uh, area of fields and, and woodlands. Folks also know about our main display gardens uh, in Chapel Hill. What holds all these three places together is the mission of the garden. I'm really excited about that mission because it includes everything from human-oriented horticultural gardens um, right through the deepest parts of nature and treating nature as a garden in itself. The display gardens of the North Carolina Botanical Garden itself um, represent the botanical diversity of the state. And North Carolina is really famous for the tremendous uh, variety of, of uh, ecosystems and species that we have. We've uh, created a kind of walk across North Carolina there where you start out in the coastal plain, you walk through the sand hills and through a coastal plain savanna, uh, dominated uh, in nature and in our garden by longleaf pine, and that, then down into a mountain collection in which uh, we have cove forest species and even 
uh, red spruce and Fraser fir from the tops of our highest mountains here in North Carolina. Uh, out on the nature trails, we present you with the Piedmont as a garden. Uh, the middle of our state uh, has to be celebrated too. Uh, it is such a diverse state going from those outer uh, banks along the ocean um, up to the highest mountains uh, east of uh, the, the Black Hills of South Dakota. Another portion of the botanical garden mentioned by Peter White is the Coker Arboretum, dating back to 1903 when Dr. William Coker converted the UNC president's five-acre cow pasture into a university treasure. Located in the middle of campus on the east side of the Moorhead Planetarium, Coker Arboretum offers a magical botany lesson to all students and visitors. The Mason Farm Biological Reserve is the third and largest component of the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Well, this is an outdoor laboratory and an outdoor classroom. Um, and that's important. Uh, you know, there's just so much you can do inside a classroom. There's just so much you can do uh, with uh, taking pieces of nature and, and, and species of plants and animals and microbes and, and doing experiments in the lab. The complexity of nature is in nature. And it's, uh, it's important to have places to study how nature works. So uh, here at the Mason Farm Biological Reserve, but also the collections of the display gardens and the Piedmont nature trails at the garden itself, or even up at Coker Arboretum, we have scientific studies going on um, that take place in nature with all of the environmental variability, all of the comings and goings of droughts and storms that, uh, that characterize our world. So it's very important to study how nature works, how plants and animals uh, interact, um, how plants grow, uh, how forests change through time uh, in nature. And so right here, right close to a major research university, we have a field station. We have a place you can study those things in the wild. The Mason Farm Biological Reserve, part of the old Morgan Mason Tract, offers unusual diversity. We're really excited about all the research that goes on at Mason Farm Biological Reserve because it help us, helps us document the biological diversity that occurs here. Um, there are over 800 plant species that have been recorded from the reserve as well as 216 bird species, 67 species of butterflies, and most of the mammals and amphibians and reptiles uh, of the Piedmont region. Another aspect of Mason Farm Biological Reserve uh, is the age of the habitats. Now, um, the land was lived on by American Indians for hundreds of years, probably thousands of years, and then began to be settled in the 1700s uh, and became a farm landscape. But farmers needed woodlands too. They didn't cut down every tree. They didn't plow every acre. They needed woodlands for uh, lumber, for fuel, um, and also uh, for acorns. Some of the earliest surveys of North Carolina you know, where folks are trying to attract settlement, talk about the acorn crop because uh, acorns were an important food source uh, for livestock. And uh, farmers used to let their livestock graze in the woodlands after the acorn crop fell. So the farmers left woods here. Uh, they left woods that we call the forests of continuity. Um, they're not virgin, they're not pristine. Um, there are some very ancient trees on those lands. I've uh, counted rings of 275 years on some of the trees at Mason Farm Biological, Biological Reserve, and those predate settlement uh, in our area. Along with Dr. William Coker and Peter White, there is another name that is synonymous with the North Carolina Botanical Garden, Dr. Richie Bell, its first director, who started work in the late 1940s. Well, we had a very good botany department at that time, and Dr. Coker uh, harked back to uh, Europe and the universities and the botanical gardens there, and just thought that if you have a botany department, uh, botany is being taught, you need a botanical garden. 
And so he was quite uh, interested in seeing that we had a botanical garden as an adjunct to the Arboretum to expand, uh, be able to do research, uh, study the native flora. Uh, in other words, for him, it was just part of the science of botany. The botanical garden provides an, a natural area, so to speak, where we can bring in other plants from other parts of the states to study them in relation to what is here, the Piedmont flora. There are mountain plants, there are savanna plants, plants along the coastal plain area there. And if you want to study these, you need a natural area to do it. It's not as natural as the original natural habitat, but it beats the greenhouse by a long shot. So we would bring in plants that we wanted to study and put them in similar habitats here in the garden and see how they uh, operated. Richie Bell, who is considered the dean of North Carolina wildflowers, explained to me why the diverse terrain and habitats of the botanical garden make such an outstanding laboratory and classroom. The fact that there were already different uh, habitats associated with the three distinct geographic parts of the state here made it a lot easier for our studies very often because we could find a place that was sort of like the mountains or sort of like the Piedmont or sort of like the coastal plain. And that kept our experimental work uh, on a much easier plane than if it had to uh, make extra greenhouses or put in cooling. Believe it or not, the North Carolina Botanical Garden was almost compromised in the 1980s. But because of the efforts of many people and the leadership of Dr. Haven Wiley, an ornithologist and professor of biology, Mason Farm was saved and protected. Dr. Wiley and others demonstrated to the university and the town of Chapel Hill why Mason Farm was a resource worth protecting. The precipitating crisis that uh, made uh, Mason Farm a particular issue for us uh, was the town and the state agreeing to construct a major highway through the middle of Mason Farm as a bypass around Chapel Hill. At that time, I already had a number of graduate students who were working at Mason Farm on uh, bird song and other aspects of bird biology and I was becoming familiar with what an unusual biological resource it was. My role was uh, primarily to coordinate uh, um, assembling the information that we had at that time about the special features of the Mason Farm area as a justification for um, placing the road someplace else. Um, I forged ahead, really, uh, despite being told by many people that nobody ever changed the position of a road proposed by the State Department of Transportation. But fortunately in this case, a number of uh, events came together and we did manage to convince people that it was more valuable as a biological reserve than, um, and the road was better placed elsewhere. So uh, we, were, we were successful eventually in not only changing the Department of Transportation's mind, but convincing the Board of Trustees to formally recognize the area as a biological reserve to be used for uh, teaching and research by university faculty and students, but also um, to be administered by the botanical garden and continue to be available to the, to the, the public. The importance of this biological reserve extends far beyond its use by plant and animal scientists. Mason Farm has been enormously important for me and for a number of other botanists and zoologists at uh, the university and many graduate students. The combination of habitats there, the, the old growth forests, uh, those uh, Aside from being astonishingly beautiful with those old hickory trees and oak trees and that understory of viburnum that was very characteristic of those Triassic basins, they are full of birds. They um, are, have been a great resource for field research. Just as important is how close it is to the, to the buildings on campus. We can 
honestly be there in five minutes from the, from the uh, classroom buildings on campus. Dr. Johnny Randall, Assistant Director for Conservation at the North Carolina Botanical Garden, told me about the many visitors who use this state treasure. Well, it's really incredible that the university has a, a wildland as close to um, the, its different departments as is Mason Farm, where you can not only do biological study on wild nature, but also uh, courses in many different fields, such as archaeology, anthropology, English art, uh, have all used Mason Farm. In fact, I've brought um, classes um, in all those different subject areas out here for different sorts of study. Well, Mason Farm has such a deep uh, biological and cultural history that a lot of people have uh, written about this land. Perhaps the best known book about Mason Farm is From Laurel Hill to Siler's Bog by John K. Terez. This work introduced me to Mason Farm over 30 years ago. Its central characters, mammals, birds, and the trees of Mason Farm have not changed at all. This is where uh, you need to be in, the, in this region of the Piedmont if you want to see those kinds of critters. To have made such an important contribution to conservation and education, the question must be asked, have the Morgans and Masons gotten proper recognition? It's an interesting question. Have the Masons and Morgans received the credit they deserve at the University of North Carolina? One might say that the meeting under the Davy Poplar would never have happened but for Mark Morgan and his efforts to bring the university here and to piece back the land uh, to make an offer from the community to the state. But I think it is significant that Morgan Creek has continued to be named for the founder of uh, much of this community and the settler in this valley. And your ecological address, your watershed address is very significant. And even if you zoom out from the map, you can still see Morgan Creek. The Mason Farm Biological Reserve uh, is, holds the Mason name, and certainly the Masons gave more than the acreage here in the Mason Farm Biological Reserve. But I think it's very significant that their name has persisted here because of their gift to the university. And having the name on the land and on the creek is probably good enough. Something new and something very green is happening at the North Carolina Botanical Garden and something the Morgans and the Masons would surely celebrate. New state-of-the-art classrooms and offices, among the most energy efficient on any campus, have been built at the Botanical Garden. Most of the rooms have plenty of natural light and great views of the old forest. We hope you've enjoyed this green gift while exploring North Carolina. <laughs>